We're going to continue with the subject of biblical prophecy and postmillennialism. I want to talk about historical expectations according to the Bible. Uh, this will be the first part. We want to discuss a number of passages found in the Pentateuch. And it's the first five books of the Bible, the books of five books of Moses. <clears throat> In question 191 of the Larger Catechism, what do we pray for in the second petition? The answer is, in the second petition, which is thy kingdom come, acknowledging ourselves and all mankind to be by nature under the dominion of sin and Satan, we pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed, the gospel propagated throughout the world, the Jews called, the fullness of the Gentiles brought in, the church furnished with all gospel officers and ordinances, purged from corruption, countenanced and maintained by the civil magistrate, that the ordinances of Christ may be purely dispensed and made effectual to the converting of those that are yet in their sins, and the confirming, comforting, and building up of those that are already converted, that Christ would rule in our hearts here and hasten the time of his second coming and are reigning with him forever, and that he would be pleased so to exercise the kingdom of his power in all the world as may best conduce to these ends. <clears throat> the last time we talked about the various schools of interpretation as well as possible uh, positions regarding the millennium. <clears throat> and as I noted, there are a number of ways these schools of interpretation combine with your view of, of the second coming and its relation to the millennium. One thing I didn't note, and it, I think it becomes important at this point, we could have taken those different schools of interpretation and millennial positions, and we could have drawn a line right through the middle of amillennialism. And <clears throat> noted that in dividing amillennialism above the line, one particular strand of amillennialism and premillennialism in its various forms are all pessimistic about the success of the gospel in history. On the other hand, there's another strand of amillennialism and postmillennialism in general, which I believe all indicate a very optimistic view. So above that line, if we had divided our, our amillennial position in two, above the line, the first amillennial position and the premillennial positions would have been pessimistic views of eschatology. <clears throat> On the other hand, amillennialism in some forms has a somewhat positive outlook. And the, that particular form of amillennialism, together with uh, the different forms of postmillennialism, share in this they have an optimistic eschatological point of view. And why is that important? Well, I think that one question we can ask and answer very clearly is whether or not the view of the Bible with respect to the success of the gospel in history, I think that there is a pretty clear picture that we can see develop. And so I think that we can rule out the pessimistic views. And that really leaves us with one form of amillennialism or postmillennialism. Now, I've already indicated that uh, for various reasons, I, I think that uh, historicism provides us with a better model as far as schools of interpretation. <clears throat> and I also think that uh, we have some rationale, some reason for viewing the millennium as a little bit more of a, a literal thousand-year period 
which is something that we're not going to talk about now. We're really not going to talk about it until we get to that point in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> but we're heading for that end. Why do I think that the Bible presents an optimistic view? Well, that's what we're going to begin covering tonight. And so as we go through these various verses, uh, each one adds a little bit of a twist, I think. Each one adds a little bit more of a particular emphasis. It is significant, I believe, that our view of history doesn't simply begin with Israel, with God calling Israel to be a people unto himself, but that our view of the success of God's gracious plan in history is already spelled out uh, not only after the fall, as we'll see, but that there is every indication before the fall that we should be more optimistic about our take on history. <clears throat> so when we understand that grace has come to restore uh, nature as well as to improve upon it, what we find out about the state of the church or the people of God prior to the fall, which may not be a lot, but what we can know is very helpful. And in fact, I think it, it begins to point us in a direction. It begins to suggest something about the nature of the endeavor. What is it that the gospel is coming to do? Is it simply to improve men spiritually? Well, I think there are contraindicators throughout the Bible that would indicate, in fact, that God's concern isn't simply with our souls, but with our bodies. The doctrine of the resurrection of the body is already telling us that a concern for the creation, the the material creation, is taken up in and subsumed under this idea of progress in the covenant of grace. <clears throat> so before we talk about that, we want to begin looking at Genesis 1, 28. Genesis 1, verse 28. <clears throat> and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. You know, this is really the first verse where man is addressed by God, and where... We're given an indication of the philosophy of history that we ought to take away away from this narrative. Uh, the, the, the idea of what history would have been apart from the fall. We need to keep in mind that the mission of redemption is to restore everything that we had prior to the fall and more. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the significance of this verse for a biblical view of history, I believe, is this. It tells us that man was created to be the crown of creation, to be the highest point of the created order on earth, to uh, being created in the image of God. He is set in the middle of the creation, to rule and reign, to have dominion, to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. There's an agenda. And the agenda takes in the whole of the earth. It's not an agenda limited to Israel. Now for time and for purpose, there will be a limiting but originally in the creation, the purpose was much more universal. It was, in fact, something that encompassed everything. Now, this verse has been referred to 
uh, in, in several ways. A lot of reconstructionists refer to this as the Minion Mandate. <coughs> uh, the fact is that prior to that, there were a lot of people who referred to this as a cultural mandate. That, in fact, it expresses God's prior claim on all of the culture of mankind. And again, that has significance for the biblical view of history. Now, that tells us that the true religion is not simply going to take up the issue of salvation. It has to do that now because of the fall. But it's going to be concerned with much more than that. There is a cultural dimension. There's a dimension that is expansive and takes in man having dominion over the creation. <clears throat> now, after that, we're faced with the fall, and we come to look at the next passage that I think is important and indicative uh, as far as the view that we ought to have, which is Genesis 3, verse 15. Genesis 3, verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This verse is called the Proto-Evangelium. It's the pre-gospel verse. Before we really understand that there is a Redeemer who is going to be sent. There's a promise here, and the promise in a very cryptic way, uh, alludes far into the future to the virgin birth of Christ by referring to the seed of the woman. But more importantly, again, for our purposes immediately in this context, this verse is telling us that there's going to be a culture struggle that that culture struggle, at the center of it, there are going to be two people wrestling. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. There's not going to be any in-between. People who think there's a gray area in this culture war, uh, they miss the point. There's a struggle. Now, the seed of the woman, <clears throat> that indicates that at the center of this struggle to establish this cultural mandate will be the church. The church is going to occupy that place because in the church we have redemption. We have, in fact, man being restored from what he was, uh, what he became as a result of the fall. Right? In Genesis 9, 1 and 7, look at that. Genesis 9, verses 1 and 7, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. And verse 7. And you, be <clears throat> fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. We have a reiteration of the cultural mandate. The call for man to have dominion. Now, this is very significant from... A couple of angles. One is, it tells us that the cultural mandate did not go out when man fell. In fact, when God destroys mankind in a flood, this cultural mandate is reiterated at the time that man, through at, or through, excuse me, through Noah, is being called upon to uh, replenish the earth. There is a reiteration, and that means that there is still a purpose involved. This is not to no purpose. God wants man to exercise dominion. And he does that by being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth. He needs to exercise a proper dominion. And in order to do that, in order to do it in a way that is, in fact, uh, consonant with the promise of the gospel, he needs to do it in faith, first 
in the faith of the Christ to come, and then later in the faith of the Christ who has come. And so, the task of the church has added to it this concern for taking in what was called the cultural mandate. We'll see this in a moment. We'll see it actually being reiterated in a, in a different way uh, so that we can see that God, although there is a spiritualization going on, uh, that God is not dismissing the church from this task. It's not simply a civil matter. <clears throat> Right, we want to turn next to Genesis 15, 5 and 16, 10. Genesis 15, verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, thou be able to number them. And said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Genesis 16, 10. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multiple. Okay, these two promises that are made to Abram are made clearly in the context of the covenant of grace, but they're made in terms of ful fulfillment of this cultural mandate. This idea of having dominion over the earth. They're going to be blessed in order to fulfill this mandate. All of this indicates or should indicate to us <clears throat> that the task of the church is not simply pie in the sky in the sweet by and by. The task of the church is to involve itself with the great matters, cultural matters of the day, to engage and to seek transformation. And to do that by multiplying, by having children, by training them up in the faith, by supplanting the wicked. The seed of the woman is struggling with the seed of the serpent. The story is, in fact, told again and again under a number of different guises throughout the whole Bible. <clears throat> These verses tell us that this mandate pertains to the church that is formed upon the promise that God made to Abram. And that ties this directly to the New Testament church. This idea that we're somehow not concerned about this, that we shouldn't be. Uh, there are a number of premillennialists in the 19th century who had a slogan that uh, you don't polish brass on a sinking ship. What they meant by that was don't bother with the cultural stuff. It was retreatist, it was pessimistic, but these promises to Abraham are exactly opposite to that. We want to look next to Genesis 22, verse 17. Genesis 22, <coughs> verse 17, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply, multiply thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. Yeah, this is, again, a promise made in the context of the covenant of grace. It was made with Abram. A promise that clearly takes in that cultural mandate, the dominion covenant. The idea that man should take dominion over all of the earth. But it adds to it something else altogether. It mentions that thy seed shall possess a gate of his enemies. 
fact, it goes on to say in verse 18, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Uh, which, if that's not an optimistic assessment of history, I'm not sure what is. But the success in history is predicated upon a couple of things, I believe here. One is, there is implied in this a reiteration again, a reiteration of the, the Proto-Evangelium, the idea that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. The idea that there is going to be a struggle. But most importantly, this idea that the seed shall possess a gate of his enemies. <clears throat> this is a very important term, gate. Something we're going to deal with again when we get to Matthew's Gospel in a number of weeks. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Here we see a, ver a very early version of that statement that Christ makes. What does it mean that the gates are going to possess the gate of his enemy? What is the gate? What does that signify? In the ancient Near East, there was only one way in or out of most cities. It was through the gate. We had a gate. And if you wanted to get into the city, you had to go through the gate. If you wanted to leave the city, you had to go through the gate. When they were under siege, the gate was closed to keep the enemy out. What this verse is saying is this. The seed of the woman is going to take the gate of the city of the seed of the serpent. Early on in the Bible, we see, in fact, the children of Cain going off and building cities. They're the ones going out and settling the world. This verse is saying, look, wherever they build a city, the seed of the woman will eventually take all of their defensive positions. Gates are defensive. They're not offensive. Gates are where cities resist the attack of the enemy. Gates are not the way they advance their cause. So from the very beginning, the seed of the serpent is on the defensive. With the announcement of the Proto-Evangelium, God himself puts his enemies on the defense. Puts them to a warning. Says, look, you're, you're going to lose here. The battle has begun. It will be engaged. But the seed of the woman will defeat you. Here it's made very clear in this verse that the seed of the woman will possess the gate of the enemies. That means you're going to have the control. It's the control point of any city. Now we want to look for further explication of this at Genesis 24, verse 60. Genesis 24, 60. <coughs> she blessed Rebecca and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands, of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those who could take them. Yeah. Rebecca is blessed, and they say, let you, you know, be the mother of thousands, of millions, and, oh, by the way, let thy seed, the seed of the woman, possess the gate of those which hate them. See, again, it's this idea of that conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the blessing is based on the promise, and the promise is rooted in the covenant. The end of it all is this, God's people 
will prevail. The cause of the wicked will fail. The wealth of the wicked is all being laid up for the just. God's people will multiply, and when they multiply, they will take possession of all of the wealth of the wicked. Now, this isn't simply a promise that is aimed at the spiritual well-being of the world, although it is that too. But it reflects an increasing prosperity. It reflects a win in history. The seed of the woman is going to possess the gate of those that hate her. Her enemies are going to fall. Truth will prevail. And as was said in some of those earlier verses, uh, in Abram's seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. I'm aware that Paul refers that to Christ. But the universalizing of that and the spiritualizing of that does not take away from its applicability and suitability with respect to prosperity in the world and the success of the gospel in the world. <clears throat> we'll see that that is, in fact, the case when we get into some of Jesus' parables in the gospels. Uh, they're much more optimistic than most people would recognize if they spent too much time listening to American evangelists. All right, Genesis 26, 4 and 5. <clears throat> Genesis 26, verses 4 and 5. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Yeah, there are two things here, two facts concerning God's promise to the church. Uh, the first is this. God's promise is that the seed of the woman will multiply as the stars of heaven. That's what Rebecca's family said, let our sister be the mother of uh, thousands of millions. But in addition to that, in addition to that point, this also is very clear that all of these countries that Abraham is passing through, God says, I'm going to give them to your seed. Now this is a declaration that that cultural mandate will prevail. It's not simply the people, but the countries. And as we'll see later, this has implications, implications which are drawn out in the answer to question 191 in the larger catechism. The idea of the magistrate uh, taking cognizance of the true religion, that it maintain it. The countries are being given to the seed of the woman. Not just Palestine or Israel, but all the countries are passing through. In every place the people of God set their feet, in other words, and we'll see that this, in fact, uh, broadens with the, with the scope of the gospel. But every place the people of God set their feet, they're not only proclaiming the gospel of Christ, but they are also staking a claim. 
they are re reasserting God's just right and authority in the world. All right, Genesis twenty-eight three. Genesis twenty-eight verse three, and God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. Here we begin to understand that God is, in fact, going to bless the people of God, not simply to make them one nation. In fact, very early on, what do we see? They're really 12 nations, 12 tribes, under one government. God's promise is that he's going to make them a multitude of people or of nations. They're not going to be small in number. This is not defeatist language. The hope being expressed here is not pessimistic about the future. Genesis 35, 11. Genesis 35, verse 11. <clears throat> and God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a, com- and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Yeah, here we see that the Abrahamic promise is in fact clarified in several respects. The gist of the promise is this. Not only are you going to multiply... But out of you will come a nation, Israel, and a company of nations, various Gentile nations. Kings shall come out of thy loins. This is not simply talking about the church or the triumph of the church. This is talking about what we would now referred to as political states or political societies. Kings are coming out of the loins of of Jacob. How can this be? God's promise extends beyond church. It extends through the church But it's not limited to the church. There is a renovating, a raising, a lifting, a restoration of of fallen humanity. But in that raising, lifting, what we have is, in fact, a promise that the net result will be not only shall all Israel be saved, but that the nations of the earth will become like Israel in this. They will become followers of the true God. So that in their national capacities, they're going to support the true religion. And that's going to be borne out more when we get into some of the discussions, some of the verses we find in the, in the prophets. But I want you... to focus on what's going on here in Genesis. Genesis is a book of beginnings, and as a book of beginnings, Genesis is, in fact, the book that is setting the paradigm. It's telling us how to read the rest of the Bible on so many questions. And that's why I'm spending so much time right now going over verses here. Uh, The rest of the Pentateuch is going to take up less of our time, because we're going to see that it's simply reiterating, reinforcing, and recommitting the people of God to the same propositions. But let's look at Genesis 48, 4. Genesis 48, verse 4. And said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful, and multiply thee. And I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Yeah, here... There's an emphasis upon 
the everlasting covenant, the covenant of grace, <clears throat> and its link to the land. Now, when we examine that question later, in, in terms of the New Testament, we will see that there is good reason to believe that, along with the Jews being called to faith, that they are they are to be restored to their land, and that eventually, when they are called to faith, there will be a national commitment on the part of the Jews, just like we want to and hope and expect on the part of the Gentile nations. Here we see the land being tied to the promise of the covenant of grace. It's one of those outward signs given to Israel. Not simply as a people of God, but as a nation in covenant with God. As the first nation to be brought into covenant with God, Right. This really should remind us to keep in mind then this. God's covenant, although at its core, the covenant of grace is spiritual in nature. It is not spiritual in nature to the exclusion of concern for the things of this life in this world. What we see in the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Give us a due portion of the good things of this life. That's borne out in this concern that we will see come up again and again. Now God, again, didn't call them out of this world into a position of being without a home. We are pilgrims passing through. But God knows the things that we need. And the nations of the earth, as we'll see, are going to serve him in their national capacity. The nations can only serve in time. The people of God can serve him forevermore. The nations, by their very nature, are limited to history. And that's going to become an issue again in some of the parables in the New Testament. And we want to look last in Genesis at Genesis 49 10. Genesis 49 verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come and until him and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And to him shall the gathering of the people be. Here we're told that the promise and the prophecy intersect in one who is identified as Shiloh, Messiah. Promise and prophecy meet in the person of Messiah. So that if these promises that we've seen take in not only spiritual but temporal concerns, then they're going to find their best exampling in the person of the Messiah. <clears throat> we want to skip now to Exodus uh, 32, 13. Exodus 32, verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saith unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. In Exodus 32:13, several things are borne out. With the coming of Israel into an established state, Moses raises this promise that we've been tracing, which is rooted in the Proto-Evangelium, which is, in fact, 
a, re, a reiteration of the cultural mandate. Moses says, look, in the formation of Israel as a political entity, there's a beginning of the fulfilling of this promise. I'm going to multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. All this land is going to be given to you. There's a combination, the land, the promise. Land is a sign of that promise. There is an encouraging of the people of God in this to see themselves rooted in history, making progress or not with respect to this Proto-Evangelium. The seed of the woman, is she ascendant or not at this time in history? Now, if she's not ascendant, it's because we're not wrestling with and striking at the seed of the serpent. The people who want peace, when God has decreed there has to be this perpetual war until one side or the other is exterminated, people who want peace in the midst of war are fools. The promise that God has given to his church is to uphold and sustain his church throughout this time. Right, next, we want to look at Leviticus 26, verse 9. Leviticus 26, verse 9. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. Yeah, and here, God tells us very clearly what? When he makes us fruitful, it multiplies us. When, in fact, he has respect to his people, and in context here, he has respect to his people when they are obedient to him, when they're doing what he's commanded them to do. When he has respect to them, he makes them fruitful, he multiplies them, and that is an establishing of the covenant. Why? Because the covenant takes in not only the spiritual, but the temporal interests of the people. It's expansive. Its end is to subdue the whole earth. Its end is to see that the entire earth is made subject to the dominion of man. But man cannot exercise a proper dominion while he is in rebellion to God. He has to be restored to a place of proper submission and himself be put under a proper authority. Moses has established a society designed to do that by the pattern of God. Right, we want to look at a couple of verses now in Numbers, beginning with Numbers 14, 21. Numbers 14, 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. <clears throat> now that's that's an important uh, expectation that is expressed here in the Pentateuch for, for a couple of reasons. One is, again, we have a sense that there's going to be victory, and the victory will be on the part of the seed of the woman. The church is going to prevail. This is not going to go on forever. Now, this is one reason why I believe we're justified in taking a little bit more literal, uh, a literal point of view with respect to the nature of the millennium. 
Again, I don't want to take up that question right now. But the, the idea that the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. That needs to be demonstrated. That needs to prevail, not simply for a moment of time, but for a significant period of time. But beyond that, this term glory of the Lord, this Shekinah, <clears throat> glory of the Lord, the rabbis understood by this Shekinah, uh, a hypostasis, that is, a person of the Godhead. In particular, they associated this language of glory of the Lord with Messiah. Now that's as much as to say this, that it's going to be when Messiah comes. It's not going to happen before that. The earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of Messiah. Now that promise, when we think of it in those terms, that begins to give us some background for better understanding things like the Great Commission, where Jesus tells him to go into all of the earth preaching the gospel to every creature. There's an expectation here that there will be a universal acceptance and acclamation, not only of the true religion, but particularly the true religion with respect to, as the rabbi said, with respect to the Messiah. The covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob then <clears throat> is a covenant of grace which stands or falls in the person of the Messiah. The universality of these promises, the fulfillment of all of these promises is to be found not, and, and we shouldn't have expected it, under the types and shadows of the Old Testament economy of the church. It's something reserved to the peculiar glory of the New Testament church. Again, those points are things which are going to uh, be discussed in more detail when we start to look at verses, passages in the New Testament. What I want you to do here, what I want you to keep in mind here, is that we're seeking a programmatic reading of Scripture. So that as we get further into the Bible, we have a better understanding of what all of these promises as they're layered on top of one another uh, what what the the intent of all of this is? <clears throat> right next, we want to turn to Numbers twenty four, <clears throat> particularly verses seventeen to nineteen. Numbers twenty four, seventeen to nineteen. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a seer out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy the children of Sheth. And Edom shall, shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remains in the city. Now this is a very important promise or prophecy. Balaam is being acknowledged, forced to acknowledge uh, as a Gentile prophet, that in fact the God of Israel is the true God and that there is Messiah coming. He's called here the star of uh, coming out of Jacob, the scepter that rises out of Israel. He's very much being associated with that scepter uh, between the feet of Judah, that, that uh, Shiloh. Messiah, that's messianic. Balaam is brought to see that. And he notes, most importantly, that this Messiah is going to have dominion. See, there's that cultural mandate idea. 
and he's going to destroy him that remaineth of the city. That's language that has reference to possessing the gate of the enemy. Messiah comes, and in the coming of Messiah, this proto-evangelium, this idea of the seed of the woman prevailing over the seed of the serpent, the idea that the multitudes of the true church are going to possess the gate of the enemy, those that hate the church, all of these ideas are, in fact, coming together. They're here in Balaam. In fact, <clears throat> so well known was this verse uh, in Persia that it's, it's very likely, highly likely. Uh, the founder of Zoroastrianism was a Jew. And Balaam was from the east. The very first people who come to see Jesus come because they see a star. They're magi. They're priests. They're holy men from the east. They're looking for the Christ. They understand that when he comes, there's going to be this submission, not only of the Jews, but of the Gentiles. Balaam talks about this. He understands this. He understands that the rise of Messiah is going to mean the decimation of the kingdoms of this world. Again, this idea is developed more fully in other places in the Bible, like in Daniel. But here we have hints of this. We're given some sense of this. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> we should gain a sense of the flow of history here, that one of the things is that we should gain from this really is that history in the Old Testament era is looking forward to the Messiah. It is, in fact, Christocentric. They're looking for the Christ to come. They're in anticipation of this. They're in an anticipation because they have the promises of God. They believe the promises of God. They long for the fulfillment. They want to see the reverse of all of the effects of the curse. So redemption is shown to us here then as a broadening river running through history. Which again is an image we'll come back to in the book of Ezekiel. The flow of church history should be seen as one conquering and to conquer. Arising in obscurity, ending in this fulfillment. That the church has been fruitful, has multiplied, has filled the earth. That the seed of the woman has in fact come to possess the gates of the enemy, those that hate her. It's a fulfillment of that proto-evangelium. It's a fulfillment of that first promise that God made when he was dressing down Adam and Eve after the fall. In the midst of him slapping them with judgments and curses, he presents to them a very important promise. And that promise really is a promise on the one hand that God wants to see the fulfillment of that cultural mandate and a promise on the other hand that he's going to have to do that through a mediator. That promise continues to crop up throughout the Old Testament. Uh, just a couple more passages for tonight in the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy 1, 8, and 10. Deuteronomy 1, verse 8. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. 
Verse 10. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. And here, the fulfilling of the promise is linked to possession of the land. There is no idea present in this that the land isn't somehow taken in. And although the land may be typical of of some things, it's not altogether a type or a shadow. Some things in the tabernacle and temple were simply shadowy. But the land itself, that's not so much. It has typical significance, no doubt. But that's because Israel as a nation is typical in some sense. That's exactly why we discern when we're talking about the laws that Israel has. Why we make distinctions with respect to ceremonial law and judicial law. But the land, possession of the land, that's not something ceremonial. That's something natural. Nations possess land Naturally, God has established the borders of the nations. He's established their bounds. That's a natural thing. And in the light of redemption, that natural thing is then brought to an elevated state in the service of the gospel. Kings will serve the church. So the multiplying of the people of God, all of this talk in the Bible about possession of the the gates of the enemy, all of that, all of that talk is really talk that is being fulfilled when the promise is linked to the land. There is a temporal aspect to these promises. Right, Deuteronomy 7.22. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 7, verse 22. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon them. Now here we, we have a principle of taking dominion because of sin. The fact is, God has... He's he's set all of these animals, these uh, beasts of the field, in place. He says, look, you're going to take dominion little by little. It's not going to be all at once, lest you be overcome. As the church increases, as it's fruitful and multiplying... The wicked will depopulate themselves. They're doing it already. It's their job to depopulate themselves. They're enemies of God, and the seed of the serpent needs to be crushed. But if God were simply to remove all the wicked from the world right now, a lot of things would collapse. We would be unable To do what we need to do. That's the principle here. Principle of taking dominion is that it's gradual. It's not going to happen all at once. And we'll we'll see that theme come up again in a number of places, particularly again in the parables in the New Testament. When we talk about the, the growth of the kingdom of God, it's not something that was to be expected all at once, but something that comes over a period of time. Right, the final thing, the final passage is Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 5. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 5. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart, and with all thy soul. 
that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out into the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Deuteronomy 30 verses 1 to 5 tells us this. God blesses his people that are obedient with increased dominion. When his people are less obedient or disobedient, he removes from them the power to exercise dominion. If we want to know why society is in such shambles, it's because the church is in such shambles. The well-being of societies are tied to the well-being of the church. The better the church does, the better society will do. The more faithful the church is, the more God will drive back the enemies of his people. As long as the church is stuck on hearing smooth things and having things presented in a non-offensive, non-confrontational way, The church is going to suffer defeat after defeat. Because you can't compromise with this. It's a war. It's the duty of the seed of the woman to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Not to make peace with it, but to destroy it. There are casualties in wars, but what we know is this. From the beginning of the end of the books of Moses, Moses is telling us that we have every expectation in history that the church will succeed, that the seed of the woman will prevail. If we're having setbacks, it's because of the lack of faithfulness on the part of so many that profess to be Christians. This ought to encourage us to be more faithful, more diligent, and less compromising with the world. There's no one in between. You're either going to be numbered among the seed of the woman or the seed of the serpent. There's no third category. It's a war. It's a war of extermination. We could have looked at all of the rules about holy war in the Pentateuch. In holy war, the people of God were commanded to exterminate the Canaanites and so on. Because that's exactly what the gospel will do. It will exterminate all of the opposition. They occupy sterile ground. It's a losing proposition. And if the church would simply be faithful to God, we have every reason, based on the promise and the covenant of God, to believe that this gospel will succeed. Yes, even in the 21st century. All right, next time, we're going to move on and talk about the promises and historical expectations in terms of the prophets, uh, particularly the major prophets, so that we can begin to see the unfolding of these principles and the anticipation of the New Testament fulfillment of these principles that's what we want to talk about next time when we take up this question. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan hard drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, 
MP3s and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know serve and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to his great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books. This is my Father's Word.